welcome back. You survived the first lecture, so I'm really excited to have you back here. Um, hopefully you took a nice long break. I Actually, looking through this lecture again, I, I think that the last section on scales is probably some of the most difficult. The rest of the statistics section is kind of statistics light, and it's actually very clinically relevant. Um, so I, I really hope that this has some practice changing things in it. Let's go back to the outline for the course just to see what we've accomplished. So we went over some helpful resources, we went over types of studies, we went over psychiatric scales. Now we're going to do statistics in this hour, how to read a paper. So we're going to do some examples of how to put all these pieces of theory into practice and then how to apply our evidence-based medicine skills and now our new knowledge into practice. In terms of this statistics part, what I'm going to focus on is significance effect size, confidence intervals. These are the most important things. We're going to dovetail a little bit into a, a relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat, number needed to harm, relative risk, and odds ratio. Um, if you don't understand these, it's, it's not as big of a deal as if you don't understand these. Eventually, we should all understand this. But uh, at this point, um, it's just most important to understand the bolded things. We'll talk about some common statistical tests and when to apply them, and then a brief checklist when reading a paper. So starting first with significance versus effect size. Uh, this is often misunderstood, I think, and, and part of the reason is, is when you publish, really what you're looking for is for a significant, for a significant effect. And part of the problem, too, is in our language, we use the word significant as if it means something, right? Oh, wow, they're significant others. Um, in the language of statistics, being a significant other means you're together, but it could mean you're together one minute of the year, one second of the year, or it could mean you're together 365 days of the year. So significant doesn't really carry quantity. It just says these two things are connected but it doesn't say how connected they actually are. So you want to be a significant other in the real world, but you don't want to be a significant other statistically speaking. Um, otherwise, that means you might just be together for a second every year. How do I know how long you're together? I know that with effect size. Um, uh, if it's a large effect size, you're together quite often. If it's a small effect size, you're together not very often at all. Um, so how big was that effect? You know, in, in terms of treatment, significance would be like Prozac has some effect. Uh, Prozac actually treats depression. Effect size would be how much does Prozac actually treat depression. First, let's talk about significance, though. What makes the result significant? No type 1 error, no type 2 error. So this is a definition based on what something is not, not really the best way to define something. What is a elephant? It's not a giraffe. It's not a donkey, it's not a goat. It doesn't really tell me what the elephant is. Still, it does help me to differentiate an elephant from other things. So no type 1 error, no type 2 error. And then it's also determined by p-value. This is really the positive way to define it. What is an elephant? Well, it has a trunk, it has legs. What makes something significant? Well, it has a p-value of less than 0 0.05 or whatever number you've, you've set up. Here's a PhD student begging to his paper. Um, for statistical significance, so he can publish it, but we live in an age of consent, of course. And this paper says no, and this paper means it, so you have to respect that. Type 1 and type 2 error. Um, this is one of my favorite, I've come back to this year after year, I think I first saw this in med school, maybe even before, and I just think it's hilarious. So type 1 error, just burn it in your brain. The doctor is looking at an elderly geriatric man and he says, oh my goodness, you're pregnant. This is obviously false. Um, elderly geriatric, uh, geriatric men cannot have babies. And so this is a type 1 error. It's a false positive. The test says, you know, let's say you do a pregnancy test, and it says it's positive, but it's impossible. Um, this actually happened to my wife when she was a teenager. And the, the, her mom believed her, but the doctor definitely didn't. Um, and so it's important to remember as doctors that tests do actually make errors that just because you have a positive COVID test doesn't mean you ha actually have COVID. There are false positives that exist. Type 2 error is a false negative. You're staring at the very gravidly pregnant lady straight in the eyes, touching her belly, feeling the kicks. 
and you say you're not pregnant. Uh, obviously, um, another fault, you know, staring at the COVID patient, staring at the very depressed patient and saying, you're perfect, gold stamp of approval, get on out of here. A little bit more on, on each of those. So type 1 error is when you think you saw something. It's also called alpha error. So that's how you can kind of remember this. Saw with alpha. You think you saw something that wasn't there. So like, for example, you use naltrexone, um, which is a common medication to, to, to use for alcohol use disorder, um, sometimes for opiate use disorder as well. And it doesn't separate from placebo, let's say. So you're still using it even though there's no difference. The doctor that makes many type 1 errors will think that their treatment is effective when it is not. So this is kind of a practice question, is what kind of doctor do I want to be? If I'm going to err on one side or the other, what kind of error do I want to make? Do I want to over-treat or do I want to under-treat? And the doctor that over-treats is going to commit more type 1 errors. The doctor that under-treats is going to commit more type 2 errors. Hopefully we're going to find a balance over time. Setting a p-value of 0 0.05 um, will help prevent type 1 errors. Still, it means that 1 in 20 published studies demonstrate an effect that are incorrect. So they're, it, they will say, airborne works. Uh, so, so, and this, is, this, is, this gets into publication bias. So let's say I do one study on airborne. Oh, it doesn't work. I do another study on airborne. Oh, it doesn't work. I do another study on airborne. It doesn't work. I do 20 studies. If I do 20 studies, it's going to work in one of those. And then I take that study and I publish it and I say, look, airborne works. Look, vitamin C works. It helps cut down sick days overall. Um, and this is uh, a problem in, 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 in not just in psychiatry but in medicine as a whole um, because there is a publication bias, and, and studies that find things end up getting published. These other 19 studies don't get published. So it's important to remember that just because there is a p-value of 0 0.05, there is still a statistical chance um, that there actually is no difference between um, the treatment. Type 2 error, you don't see something that is there. So example, you look at Prozac and you give it to a bunch of people and you say there's no difference in the change of their depression. Uh, this is determined by uh, power or sample, sample size. Um, power is arbitrarily set to 0.8 and this means that 20% of published studies will, will state that a treatment has no effect when it actually does. So this is really interesting because if I do um, five studies on Prozac, um, Statistically, four of them will say that uh, Prozac, and I set my power, which is an average power, almost all studies are set at 0.8, and this will be in the study. If I set my power to 0.8, um, four of them should come up and say that Prozac uh, will have an effect. One of them will say that Prozac has no effect, when in fact it actually does. And this is where it gets scary with the systematic uh, reviews, where then the systematic review could take all the studies with Prozac that have no results, that show no difference, and it puts them all together. Now, in a systematic review, it actually might show something, but if each of those individual studies are, are poor, then uh, it still might not. So the takeaway point is just because a single study says that there's no effect, there actually could be an effect. You just need to power your study more. You just need more of a sample size. And we've already seen this in the last hour with pooled uh, meta-analysis with this diamond showing that CBT actually does have efficacy when in fact all of these separate individual studies don't. So really the systematic review is the way that you prevent type 2 error uh, typically. Uh, that's it for significance, so it's really just type 1 and type 2 error. Um, knowing that it's neither of those, and then, of course, setting your p-value to something so that you're not actually collecting, and your power. It's really setting p-value and power. Uh, effect size is the next step. So I know that Prozac has a difference. I know that CBT is, is better than control. Um, how good is it? Is CBT going to give me some loose change, or is CBT going to give me stacks of $100 bills. I want this one, right? This is the treatment that I want to pick. I want to show me the money, give me, give me the most bang for my buck, so to speak. 
How do we calculate effect size? There's actually a variety of calculations. Uh, it's funny because most papers just give you a number. They don't really say Cohen's D. Um, or another one that they use is often called um, Hodges, um, Hodges G. Um, I think it's Hodges. It might be Hedges. I think it's Hodges, though. Um, of course, there's other ways to calculate effect size, but this is just the one that's used ubiquitously, really, in all of medicine. So a small effect size would be chump change. This is uh, effect size around 0.2 or, or less. Medium effect size is around 0.5. And a large effect size is around 0.8. So if, if let's say Prozac only gives me this, do I really want to use Prozac, right? Um, it's, it's not really important. Now if Prozac gives me this, I'm be using it for every single of my patients. So each of these is, is, is Prozac helping out. Prozac is significant for each and every one of these effect size values. The question is, is how big of a change does it make? And that's a really, really important question. Just to show you the equation for how you actually calculate effect size, and this equation will vary depending on um, which calculation for effect size you're using. And this is Cohen's D. Cohen's D equals the mean of your uh, treatment, I think this is your treatment population, minus the mean of your control population over the pooled standard deviation of both. And you really always need to uh, report p-values um, with effect sizes. If you don't report those together, I don't know what to do with uh, the information that you've given me because I don't know how big of an effect it actually makes. You can calculate effect size on your own if you really want to get nerded out on this or not. It's up to you. Um, here's an online calculator that you can use. There's also a whole um, program suite called R that has its own um, ways to do that. Here's an interesting um, relationship between type 1, type 2 error and effect size. This is using a program called uh, G Suite um, or G Power. This is free to download actually and you can kind of play around this with this on your own. So B is of, of course power um, or type 2 error. A is alpha or, or type 1 error. And essentially what, I've, what I can put in is I can put in an effect size and then I could see how big my sample size needs to be in order to see that effect. And so here my effect size is 0.3, so it's a relatively small effect size. And you can see the program, and then it says you need to enroll 80 patients in your study, in this theoretical study you're making. Versus an effect size of a 0.5, now I only need to enroll 26 patients. So the lower the effect size, the more sample size I need in order to, in order to see that population, um, in order to prevent a type 2 error. Examples of reading effect sizes in a paper, so I want to make this as simple as possible. I want you to be able to understand it. I don't want you to have to focus too hard. So here's an example. Um, effect size estimates and hazard ratio for primary outcome. Now, they, fortunately, sometimes papers don't do this, but they've actually given us the zero line, which is really nice. They've given us the other zero line right here, which is a hazard ratio of one. A hazard ratio of one means, you know, it's a ratio, so any ratio that's one means there's no difference between um, control and, and intervention. Effect size of zero, of course, doesn't mean anything. So what these lines are is the confidence intervals. Now, if your confidence interval, and we'll talk about this in a second when we talk about confidence intervals, but if your confidence interval ever crosses the, 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 the zero line, it doesn't matter if it looks like you have an effect size. If your confidence interval crosses that line, then that means there's actually no effect. And so looking down at the study, we have acamprosate no effect, now trexone no effect. And this is, this is effect size of, uh, this is the combined trial. Um, this is the uh, combined trial, and this is uh, using acamprosate and altrexone, or um, uh, therapy, essentially, for alcohol use disorder. Um, and you can see that really none of them are separating until we get here. And, and this says uh, naltrexone with no CBTI. This is actually like a subset of another population. But they've already shown that naltrexone on its own doesn't work. This is like naltrexone with now therapy. And they're saying, oh, look, it has a tiny effect. And the, the, and the effect, notice the effect is like around 0.2, maybe, at best. It could still be over here. That's the purpose of the confidence intervals. I think it's somewhere on this line. I think most likely it's in the middle, but it could be anywhere. And it's a good point, too. So this is a very, very small effect. And it doesn't really make sense to me because we've already said that naltrexone doesn't actually separate from placebo. The 
and this is why it's important to know this, the abstract of this paper says that this paper discovered that naltrexone was effective for treating alcohol use disorder. This is totally incorrect according to their own results that they published. And, and I think that this escapes many people simply because you don't know confidence intervals and you don't look at the line and you're like, wait a second, none of these cross. It's really just as simple as that. You can see it over here, none of them, none of them are really crossing except again for this one, which is like, I don't even know what this, this result is. So um, this is why this stuff is so powerful so that, that you don't get misled by an abstract. Um, this is really the same uh, paper, but showing it in a different form. We don't really need to go over this. So. Um, confidence intervals uh, can be ca very important then, and, and we had a, a really good segue into that with the last. Um, really, it can be calculated for any statistical test. Um, this includes absolute risk reduction, sensitivity, Pearson's value, t-test, effect size, and, and it really should be because we want to know the range um, of our results and we want to know if it crosses the line of, of um, zero or, or in the case of like relative risk or something one. At the top of the confidence interval, there's a 1 in 40 chance, or a 2.5 chance, that this number represents the real value. So really, like I said previously, that, that, that confidence interval is telling me what the odds are that the true value is here versus here versus here. And that's the purpose of the confidence interval, is it, it tells me where the true value is. So this is why a narrow confidence interval is very nice. Like if I had a very narrow confidence interval around an effect size of, let's say, 1, then I would say, oh, for sure, this thing is, is, is around an effect size of 1. But if I had a wide effect size spanning, let's say, 0.5 to 1.5, I would say it's probably around 1, but, you know, there is a 1 in 40 chance that it's, that it's actually 0.5. Alternatively, there's a 1 in 40 chance that the effect size is actually like 1.5. And so it's giving me all, all the data that I kind of need, and it's showing me how close that data is together. Um, the way you get a narrow confidence interval is by getting more and more data. So you begin to see um, uh, that it's mostly falling into this range, closer and closer to that value. Um, if it crosses zero, then it's a negative trial confidence interval. Uh, but if the confidence interval is past zero, some authors argue that it's probably significant. Now, I, I, we won't get into that, but um, essentially, like, you could say, like, let's say I have a huge confidence interval. It barely crosses zero, but like, 99% of it is 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 in the is in the green. Is is actually making an effect. Some authors will argue, you know, this really does look like it actually exists. But I would say you just need to get more data, do a better study. Um, but if that's the only study we have, then we 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 do have to think, you know, maybe, maybe this medication could do something. Um, here again is 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 those effect size at works, and we can we can see that the confidence interval is, is crossing each of these zero lines and in the hazard ratio they gave us the line. The paper really should give you this, but sometimes they don't. Um, you can always Google if, if you never know, like let's say you didn't know the hazard ratio and it wasn't here, you would say, um, what is the, uh, you would Google like, what is, what is the no, uh, the non-significant line for a hazard ratio? the non-significant line for how to write. If you just Google that, it would say one, and then you go, oh, okay, look, look, they're all crossing one. Sometimes they'll do that when they're, they're trying to be sneaky, they won't give you the line. So the, the, all of this comes together in, in a very practical kind of real-world example. So let's say you were a health, um, a health, what's the right word, a government official that was in charge of the health of this entire, in this entire country. And, and, and you had to pick between these four programs. And program A reduces the rate of death by 20%. Um, program B reduces the absolute death reduction by 3%. Uh, program C increases patient survival from 84% to 87%. And program D, um, you need 31 people. And, and, and if you have 31 people and you treat them, then, then one person doesn't die. And this is basically to introduce uh, the, the, the next section on absolute re risk reduction because all of these can be converted into each other. And uh, the trick is, is that these are actually all the same things. 
This is very difficult. I don't expect you to know this because this same survey was actually sent to 182 board certified members of England's health authority. So this is literally all they did in England. Their job is to know statistics. Their job is to um, make big decisions for entire countries based on what will reduce mortality the most. 140 people responded to that survey, and out of those that responded, only three were correct in identifying that all four of these programs were actually the same. So it's okay to not know this. Uh, there are many people that this is their job to know this that do not know this, and that that's really the problem. Um, but. Program A is essentially just a relative risk reduction that reduces the risk of, of death by 20%. Program B is an absolute risk reduction. It produces an absolute death reduction of 3%. These are the same thing. Program C is an absolute risk reduction. Notice that it's still 3%, right? Now you're just increasing survival. It's still 3%. Uh, and then program D is the number needed to treat. It's 31 people needed to enter to avoid one death. So let's go over each of these. Again, looking at our outline, if you flipped back to that, this would be kind of the subsection that I said wasn't as important. You want to know significance. You want to know effect size. If you get a little confused on this part, that's OK. All these experts were confused. But it really just boils down to, to, to knowing some simple equation. So, so for example, let's say we want to calculate the absolute risk and the relative risk of death um, for, let's say, you someone has a, a yeah, uh, a medical therapy to prevent heart attack versus a coronary artery bypass. You go in, you open their chest, you change all their blood vessels. And I want to see how many people uh, I need to treat with a coronary artery bypass in order to have some kind of effect. Um, with our control being just medical therapy as, as, as usual. So the absolute risk of death would just be this number, 404 people that are dead over the number alive over the total number of patients, right? So for people that, that, were, that have had a heart attack, that were worried of having another heart attack, according to this, 30% of them will be dead um, after 10 years. Now what about with the intervention? With the intervention, 26% of people will be dead after 10 years. So this means we've saved, there's been an absolute risk reduction, right, of about 4%. So do I want meds for 10 years, or do I want you to crack open my chest, change all, all the vessels around this very extensive surgery? It helps 4% 4, 4 according to this study. This is the relative risk of death will just be the odds of dying with uh, the intervention over the odds of dying with the control. And basically, you get 87%. So that's going to be your relative risk. It's just the odds of the odds of dying with the intervention over the odds of dying with the control. So you get about um, you know 13% uh, benefit essentially from it. That's the relative risk reduction is just 13%. So these are different ways of saying the same thing. The absolute risk reduction is 4%, right? You just minus the odds of death for the um, control minus the odds of death for the intervention. And then the number needed to treat is 1 over the absolute risk reduction, which is 1 over 24. So hopefully this, this kind of brings those figures to life. And um, essentially, these are all just saying the same thing. So this is just to say that relative risk, relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, and number needed to treat are all interrelated. They're interrelated by these equations, and there's different ways of thinking about it. For me, um, my mind, and the way I'd probably explain it best to patients, is with absolute risk reduction, that's probably the easiest way to know, because I'm saying this is by cracking over your chest over 10 years, over a bunch of 1,300 patients, 4% more survived. And, and now it's up to the patient to decide if, um, if, 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 that, if that treatment is what they want. We're in statistics, so I hope you're having a lot of fun. Um, Buddy the Elf is. He's loving statistics. They're his absolute favorite. Um, so just to remind ourselves here of those four equations, just one more time, the absolute risk of death equals the number dead over the total sample. The relative risk reduction equals 1 minus the absolute risk of death for the intervention 
over the absolute risk of death for the control. The absolute risk reduction is the absolute risk of death for the intervention minus the absolute risk of death for the control. And the number needed to treat is 1 over the absolute risk reduction. Again, just an aside, just so we've gone over that, those kind of concepts. The experts aren't as good as we hope sometimes. I do not know. Oh, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, in case you like looking at tables, here is a, another, and, and you really love algebra, here's another way of looking at it. So we have now covered almost everything in statistics. You've done a great job. Half of you are probably bored by this. Half of you are still with me. I'm still talking to both groups. I'm trying to keep you in the game. So let's look at common statistical tests and then a brief checklist for when we, when we write papers. So there's two types of data. There's parametric type of data and there's non-parametric. Again, this is more of an aside. Um, parametric data can be seen on a continuum. So these aren't categories. These are numeric values. An example would be height, weight, blood pressure, glucose. So, you know, glucose, it goes from 0 to 1,000 blood pressure, it goes from 0 to 200, hopefully, right? Um, so it's just those nice continuous numbers. Non-parametric are things that aren't ranked. This is more qualitative. So parametric, more quantitative, more numbers focused. Non-parametric, more qualitative. Um, now this is using numbers to, 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 to rank things. So like, for example, um, how well did you sleep last night? You know, one is, is, is great, number four is not great. And then, you know, you have two and three in the middle, right? These aren't really, um, it's not like hours of sleep, which would be parametric. It's more of like a quality of sleep. It's, it's a subjective assessment. And then the question is, is what kind of data do you think psychiatry uses? And the answer is that psychiatric scales are all non-parametric. Look at the PHQ-9, for example. Little interest or pleasure in doing things. Not at all. Several days, more than half the days, or nearly every day. Um, now, we're trying to quantify something, but is several days of little interest really half as much as more than half the days of little interest? Like, is that quantitatively half as much? Not really, right? Um, we're just assigning numbers to things that, in order to try to quantify something that's not really quantifiable. Um, really interesting, right? Um, and that, that's true if you look at any of these categories. Why is this important? Because you can only use certain statistical tests for non-parametric data versus parametric data. Um, these are the statistical tests and the non-parametric equivalent. So for example, the t-test is only for parametric data. You cannot use a t-test for non-parametric data. If you do, you have to use um, something that's been, been been um, changed to accommodate for that non-parametric influence. An example would be like the Mann-Whitney U-test. Um, of course, the purpose of any t-test or a Mann-Whitney U-test is to compare two things. So, you know, I'm trying to look at, at two variables. I'm trying to look at depressed versus non-depressed people. I would, I would use a t-test. Um, uh, Key-squared or chi-squared um, compares two qualitative variables. Um, so essentially, this is a non-parametric, um, oh, excuse me, too quali qualitative. You know what? I think this should have been. We'll see it in practice, and, and, and we'll see how this kind of shakes out. But for now, we'll just leave it. No, no, it's qualitative. Um, so it's too qualitative. So I think this is always non-parametric, actually. Um, ANOVA, it's an analysis of variance, compares three or more things. This is really just... Um, um, ANOVA is, is just um, parametric. Analysis of variance by ranks is um, non-parametric. And the Pearson's coefficient is parametric. The Spearman's coefficient rho is non-parametric. And it, is, is so, it assesses the strength of line correlation between two variables. So like, how closely is cigarette smoking and lung disease? How, how closely are those related? That would be um, a Pearson's coefficient. Um, so. Let's look at these in practice because I think this is the most important, and, and these will go into your post-test questions as well. What is the difference in height between men and women? First of all, is this parametric or non-parametric? Well, it's height. 
it's qual quantitative, so this should be parametric. And then if I'm determining between two things, what would that uh, test be? I think, and we'll, we'll test myself here, I think this should be a T test. Oh, and in fact it is, very good. Now this is, um, do plasma glucoses increase more for one, two, or three hours after a meal? So now I have to think, is, is glucose parametric or non-parametric? Glucose, of course, is, is quantitative, it's on a scale with numbers, so it's going to be parametric. Now I'm not testing two values, in which case that would be a t-test, I'm now testing three values. So I think that this should be an ANOVA, and in fact it is. And then the third question, will a California resident have an easier time getting into medical school than a Hawaiian resident? So is this um, parametric or non-parametric? This would probably be non-parametric is, is, again, just a guess because there is no continuum of California residents. This isn't a quantitative thing. This is a qualitative thing. There is no continuum of Hawaiian residents. I am comparing two types of residents, so it will be something like a t-test um, and that non-parametric -par form of a t-test, like I said, is the chi-squared. So, in fact, that is the chi-squared here. So hopefully that makes sense now. The next and last question is, is A1C related to triglyceride levels in a type 2 diabetic? We're looking for a relationship. We have A1C, which is um, a quantitative, right? It's a bunch of numbers. We have triglycerides, which is quantitative. It's a bunch of numbers. Um, and, and so that will be parametric data. We're looking for the relationship between those we're trying to plot it on a, on a linear line and so this will be the Pearson's coefficient. So hopefully um, this makes sense of these uh, simple tests on, on kind of a more practical level. So in conclusion you made it, we made it, we did statistics, statistics wasn't as hard. I just want you to know significance, I want you to know effect size, confidence interval, super super important. If you know these three things down cold you're really going to be able to read a paper well. Um, papers should really show the difference between the benefit and harm. Papers need to tell us how many patients am I hurting using this medicine, how many patients am I helping using this medicine. Papers should also give us common statistical tests or other reasons why they did otherwise. So if they're not using Pearson's and they're, 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 they're looking at a, a linear line, why in the heck are, are they using this other weird statistical test? If they don't explain it, I'm, I'm not as interested in that study. Um, be concerned when a paper conducts a post hoc analysis, subgroup analysis contains a surrogate endpoint. So sometimes papers will say, um, I know what we'll do. We'll see how well Prozac works with a surrogate endpoint at like three weeks. Oh, look, Prozac works really good at three weeks. This isn't the way I'm treating patients. I'm going to use Prozac for like six months. I'm going to use Prozac for a year. Um, and then they'll say, oh, look, Prozac works at six weeks or Prozac works at eight weeks. If I don't have any more data beyond that, I'm probably not going to be as interested in that medicine. Another thing they'll do is, is post hoc or subgroup analysis, which is really an example of the subgroup analysis is an example of that um, naltrexone paper with the combined study, where they're like, look, naltrexone doesn't work, but then they said, no, naltrexone definitely works because of this subgroup that works. And, and that kind of defeats the purpose there. That, that's, that's different from the other results they had. And then the post hoc analysis is when you take all the data and you create a new hypothesis out of your data. So, so you're fitting the, 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 you take, instead of starting with hypothesis and seeing if it's true, you get all the data and then you say, what hypothesis can I make fit this? Um, and that's problematic too. Um, so we want medicines that work for everyone. We want medicines that, that, that actually don't have bias and, and we want them to, to, to work for a long time. And so that, that's what would be avoided in all of these things. We did it. How to read a paper. So how to read a paper. First we ask what kind of study is it? Um, we've kind of already gone over this. This is synthesis a little bit of last lecture. So what kind of study is this? Is this a randomized controlled trial? Is this a systematic review or is it something else? What was the question? Does the question actually match up? If it's a randomized controlled trial, we need to know that we're comparing treatment of, of a placebo and not a placebo. What were the methods? Does this um, paper actually make any sense to me? Is this like my patient population? And now we can look at four and five using our statistics. What were the results? Were there any significant results in this? And what was the effect size? Did the significant results make any meaningful difference in the real world? 
And are the confidence intervals reported? Um, because if they're not, then I'm a little suspicious that maybe it crossed the line of zero. Maybe that's why they didn't report it. And then are these findings relevant to my patients, as I already said, and, and, and when, when should I draw the line and say, this, this actually isn't a good treatment for you? Um, so what kind of study is it? What is the study question? This is kind of a review of the last hour, so hopefully this helps. Let's say you take a bunch of studies. This is, so so you know, the answers here will be, um, um, case control, expert opinion, cohort, prospective, retrospective, which are two different types of cohort, systematic review, randomized controlled trial, um, cross-sectional survey, right? That'll be the, the answers to these questions. So question one, take a bunch of studies on antidepressants, you pool all the data, and you find which is the most effective in treating depression. So I'm taking a bunch of studies together. This is going to be a meta-analysis, which is a specific type of systematic review. A meta-analysis is just um, quantitative. Um, so a systematic review is a meta-analysis is using numbers. I'm now showing numbers. Uh, it's a specific subtype of a systematic review. I, I almost use them interchangeably, I, although technically they are different. Um, oops, I, 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 you didn't see that. I, in the second question, you take 2,500 um, 2, veterans and check all of them three months after uh, they got back to the U.S. from the Iraq War. You see if they get a TBI and, they, they, and you see if it's related to the risk for PTSD, which it very much is. TBI and PTSD are very much related. So essentially what we're looking for is the prevalence of TBI, right, and the prevalence of PTSD. So if I'm looking for the prevalence of each of these, that is most closely related to a cross-sectional survey. So we, you actually did learn something in the first hour. Uh, question number three, search for all the articles on panic disorder from 1980 to 2010, sift through them and find relevant ones to read, read these articles, and then write a single article on different aspects of panic disorder. So now this is a systematic review, and you can see how the meta-analysis is pooling data, um, so it, but it's taking a bunch of studies and pooling the data. The systematic review is looking at it more of a, in a qualitative way. It's just going through each of those and finding common grounds. Here's some more options. You were uh, treating COVID delirium and you used 10X and you saw marked improvement and you write up a case on that. Um, so, you know, I kind of already gave away the answer. This is a case report. Number five, you interview 15 patients in 1917 who are hospitalized with mania. You record staff and patient interactions and then discuss uh, manic interpersonal um, uh, strategies. This is a real study. This is a qualitative study. And I just threw this in. Um, uh, actually to kind of trick us all um, and to say, you know what, there's these other types of studies that we haven't even talked about. So the case report and all of that, I mean, the case report is kind of qualitative, but you can have quantitative aspects. But th there's this whole other area of research called qualitative research with its own subheadings. And so I just wanted to say, and it has this narrative like this, you know, it's going to have a bunch of data. It's, 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 it's going to have... Um, and by data, I mean it's going to have a bunch of uh, narrative description, a bunch of writing. Someone's going to have to log all this writing. They might find common words. And this is all qualitative research. And then the last question, you search through government records and look at antipsychotic exposure and 6,881, 66,881 schizophrenic patients from 1996 to 2006 are patients who are compliant with their antipsychotic treatment, more likely to suffer from cardiovascular disease than patients who are not. So this is trying to find cause. Do antipsychotics cause cardiovascular disease? And the um, study that's best for cause is a cohort study. You're looking at an exposure, um, and, and you're trying to see if that's related to a disease. So we already went over what kind of study is it. We're viewing the different kinds of studies and what were the investigation questions because both of those are closely related. Uh, the next question is what are the methods? Um, so let's take an example for this. Um, this is uh, the FIN11 study. Uh, this, is, this is actually that last um, one that we just went over, that last cohort study. It's 11-year follow-up on mortality in patients with schizophrenia, seeing if antipsychotics affect the mortality, cause greater increases of heart attacks and strokes and things like that. Um, now, the question is, is, you know, in, in methods, is this a good sample size and 
how did they get this sample? Is this sample anything like mine? That's kind of the stuff that I'm particularly looking for in, in this. And so you see the method section. They looked at mortality in 60, that's humongous, 66,000 patients, and a total population of 1. So they looked at like 5.2 million records between this long. That's like 10 years. And then they looked at all-cause mortality um, oh my goodness. Okay, so this seems amazing so far. And the six most frequently is, and they even separated. They even separated out the difference so they didn't lump all the antipsychotics together. Um, they separated the, the atypicals and the typical antipsychotics. I really like where this is going. Um, now, I do have some questions here. Did they look at dosing um, in their methods? Like, for example, um, you know, they're saying that, that, that they looked at all these different types of antipsychotics. Now, are they looking at like, oh, look, Zyprexa doesn't, doesn't cause a change in, or, or lanzapine doesn't cause a change in, 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 in cardiovascular risk. We looked at one milligram. Well, lanzapine goes up to 40, 60 milligrams some patients are on. So maybe it doesn't cause any change at one milligram, but did they dose it correctly? And that's actually a really common problem in psychiatric, psychiatric papers is, is the dosing is just all weird. And then they say, oh, look, there's no effect, or they say it doesn't cause anything. And that, that, so you always want to look at the dosing. Unfortunately, it takes some digging a lot of the time to find the dosing. Um, another question I have is, is what does on medication and off medication mean? How did they, how did they tell that the exposure actually occurred? Um, and the paper does get into that. They, they, they checked it based on um, pharmacy records, and they just assumed that um, the person that picked up their medicine actually took it. Now the question is, is that actually a good way? I, I mean, the problem in some of this is you can always nitpick and you can always find some area of weakness. I don't, you know, we're not going to be like Dr. House and go to everyone's apartment and look in their refrigerators and look in their pill bottles and actually check. So sometimes there's just real world limica limitations, and and I, I I mean if they didn't pick up their medicine, you definitely know they're not taking it. Um, so that's how they did it in this study. Now what were the results? So we've gone from methods now to results. So here's the results, and again, just look at they gave you the line one one one. So I'm just looking for significant results. Okay, this looks significant. Oh, it's clozapine. Clozapine. Whoa, clozapine makes mortality better. So I'm less likely to die if I'm on clozapine and schizophrenic and in Finland than if I'm not. Interesting. What about these others? So um, perfenazine has no effect. Polypharmacy, weird. Polypharmacy has no effect. Olanzapine has no effect. That's interesting because it's the most metabolic. But then look at some of these others. These all say they increase mortality. Risperidone, Haldol, Quetiapine. Interesting. I wouldn't have necessarily expected that. And you can see why it's important to have all these separated, because if I lumped all them together and let's say I had more clozapine, the clozapine might pull all of these um, together. So again, again, what we talked about with key squared or chi squared and, and not having a heterogeneous sample comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, you can't compare the apple of clozapine to the orange of these others, because um, that'll, that'll mess up your results. Um, so now my question is, OK, so we have um, it looks like significant results uh, because they're, they're not crossing the line. Now, this is the risk of death from any cause that I was looking at in, in A. Now, the question is, is, is this a, how effective is this? So now I kind of have to eyeball it. Oh, no, it says it right here. So, so the um, adjusted hazard ratio, it says on average for clozapine is 0.74. So that means it's about maybe a 25% reduction in mortality. So is a 25% reduction, how, how big of an effect is that? I, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's not bad. Um, this is the worst, let's say, quetiapine. You know, it's almost a 50% increase in mortality over, over 10 years. Interesting. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe this is something to think about. Now the question is, is now that I know these, 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 these Finnish people um, that, that have schizophrenia, um, is this actually effective um, for, for mine? Like, let's say, um, you know, right now I'm in San Bernardino. Our schizophrenic people in Finland are, are the tall uh, uh, Finnish people that are all 100% um, um, white, similar 
to the population of San Bernardino, a very diverse, ethnically lower socioeconomic status patient? Are these really the same? Um, you know, it's a question I don't necessarily have the answer to. Is, is 11 years enough time? Just a question I had when I read this paper to judge whether antipsychotic affects mortality or not. Maybe this is something that actually needs 20 years. Um, but we did see it, it separate, so I would say it does, right? Um, was this really a good way to measure patient adherence? Was seeing if they actually picked up the medication from the pharmacy a good way, or could there have been a better way? I think, you know, I mean, with the limitations of the real world, I, I, I don't know how else they could have really done it. Um, would a larger sample size have shown a difference um, in some of the things that weren't significant? Are they really not significant, or did we commit a type 2 error? Was there actually um, a finding um, there, and, and I said, oh, no, you're not pregnant. Um, oh, no, you're not going get, to get hurt from antipsychotics, or it's not going to help you, but in actuality, I just need more data. Um, I think in this case, the answer to this is no, because they did it for like 60,000 people. That, that's a big enough sample size. And how does this change my counseling of patients? So, you know, I, I do go over this from time to time with patients. They ask, you know, will this help me? I would just say, right, you know, it depends on how detailed you want to be right now. We don't have any evidence that, that this medication, olanzapine, hurts you. It could mean that we need more studies. I don't think that. It could also mean it was just done with, for lack of a better word, depending on how colloquial you want to say, it was done with a bunch of white people. And um, in people that are not white, I, I don't know the answer. We actually don't have the answer yet. But... We have a good guess. Um, people are closer to other people than people are to, um, you know, sometimes with animal studies, people will use those and try to import those on, on, on to populations. And I mean, those are really far away. So, I mean, sometimes scientists will say, like, we have this rat study and, you know, the rats really benefited from this medicine, so it's going to help all people everywhere. And, well, that's, <laughs> that, that, you can't compare that. So at the very least, I have a human study testing humans. But we know that there are difference between humans, even humans in the same population. And so, um, you know, it just depends on how detailed you want to be with your counseling. Um, practical implications. So maybe this is an example of something I would, I would tell a patient. I can tell patients that we have evidence that antipsychotics increase glucose and lipids, but no evidence that they will die easier because of this. In fact, there's evidence that some antipsychotics, like clozapine, um, actually help extend their life. Um, very cool. Of course, we don't want to be like, <clears throat> I think this is Grover, trust me, I'm a doctor. So, you know, a patient says, well, doctor, why should I use um, Prozac? Why not Zoloft? We don't want to say, trust me, I'm the expert here. We want to try to give them as much information. In the past, this is okay. Trust me, I'm a doctor when medicine was more paternalistic and the doctor was clothed in his greatness with his white coat on. But now with, with, with kind of medicine where it's at now, um, patients want to have a doctor that, that interacts with them, that listens to their complaints, and, and actually gives them the evidence as best as they can. So this is um, how I think about it. We've already talked about this in some of my other talks. But what we really want to know is pretest and pro post-test probability. So the pretest probability is um, a probability that a patient has a disease even before a test is performed. So like, let's say a patient is in the ICU, they have psychosis. There's an 80% chance that that patient has delirium, um, even before they consult me. And I just know that because I know 80% of the patients in the ICU have delirium. So um, if I know this, it gives me a lot of, of power because I already know what the most likely answer is. Then the post-test is I go into the ICU, I do serial sevens, I do an ANO questions, where are you? They don't know where they are. And um, a psychotic person really should, right? I just saw one outside of the Costco yesterday. They're very psychotic, it's 110 degrees, they're wearing a heavy sweater. And they're like, I'm at Costco, I need a lighter, right? They know where they are, they're, they're, they're learning, the delirious people won't know that. Um, and so now I've confirmed my diagnosis with, with these other tests. Um, what is the value? You'll know the diagnosis before even entering the room. So you walk in the ICU, you're like, this is delirium. Here's a cool example um, from my own life. My 22-year-old nanny had to take a day off of work to assist her mother after her mother had an operation. What operation did her mother have? Well, I've been through general surgery, right? I've been through that rotation. I, I saw a million lap coles. I know it's the most common surgery, so I go, your mom's having a lap cole. She's 40. Um, she's probably, you know, like the average American, a little overweight. I didn't say that, of course. Um, and, um, you know, the mnemonic in med school is 40 fertile. Um, female, um, 
is 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 biliary disease, and people say kind of like this guy, "Are you a wizard? How do you know this?" I just know pretest and post-test probability well. Um, the pretest probability, of course, will change on the setting. So, like we talked about delirium in the ICU, it's eighty percent. Hospital floor, it's about 20%, driving the hospital 5 to 10%. So knowing where you are and where your setting is. Um, how do I learn this? There's really two ways. One is just to continue to practice where you are, and you're, you're going to know perfect practice, um, practice makes. And, um, you know, for example, like at the VA, when I go there, I expect to see a lot of PTSD, a lot of traumatic brain injuries, and a lot of substance, just because I've seen that a bunch there. If I'm at a medical floor, I expect a lot of delirium, substance, um, and depression. If I'm in an inpatient psych ward that's outside of the VA, then I expect more borderline methamphetamine use, schizophrenia, and bipolar 1, just because I've seen a bunch of patients in these respective places. So if I see someone psychotic at the VA, I'm going to say maybe they got their head hit. Maybe it's substances. If I see someone psychotic on an uh, inpatient private psychiatric hospital, I'm going to say maybe they're borderline. Maybe they have meth. Maybe they have marijuana. Um, maybe they're schizophrenic. It's, it's going to be a little different. The other way is just to read books and articles and try to memorize as best as you can that disease prevalence. Maybe even keep an updating log. Here's a, a little bit just to get us started on our path to knowing more about prevalence. Depression, of course, the lifetime prevalence is very high. It's very common for someone to be depressed at least once. Anxiety, lifetime prevalence is very high. So, you know, we just, this is bread and butter. This is what we expect. We expect when a patient walks in our office, they have depression or anxiety. We don't expect as much ADHD, but that's very prevalent in the population. 3% of the adult population, 1% of the population is bipolar, 1% schizophrenic. This is even prior to walking into my office. Now they're in my office, the likelihood's probably higher. Dementia, great increased risk after ADHD. An old person walks into my office, I'm more worried about dementia or, or some kind of dementing disease, some neurocognitive impairment greater than anything else. So this is one half of the coin. One half of the coin is, is, is finding the correct diagnosis. And how am I going to find the correct diagnosis? The way I'm going to find the correct diagnosis is with pre-test and post-test probabilities. Then I, I know my disease prevalence. I've arrived at the correct diagnosis. How am I going to actually treat a patient? Um, and the way that we're going to do that is by knowing effect sizes. And here's a bunch of studies <coughs> that are actually listed. Uh, by the effects, uh, by the effect size for different conditions. Now, this effect size is going to be medicine specific. It's going to be disease specific. So we use lamotrigine for bipolar depression. Its effect size is going to be 0.13. Lamotrigine for, let's say, bipolar mania, it doesn't have any effect. Lamotrigine for MDD, it's going to have a different effect size. So we're going to have to know lamotrigine's effect size for all these host of conditions, not just for the primary condition that it's used to treat. So you're going to have to find just a lot of different studies on this. This is my own personal work in progress. I'm trying to find as many effect sizes as I can so that I kind of have a running catalog of what do I expect from this medicine. Because if I'm going to use Lamotrigine for bipolar depression, what I'm going to say, I'm going to say, this medicine may work. It may help prevent depression. It's not going to work very well compared to other medicines. It's really not. But it's not going to have any side effects. So if, if I have a patient that doesn't want side effects at all, and doesn't care as much about efficacy, I'm going to pick Lamotrigine. If I, if I have a patient that, that, that really cares about efficacy but doesn't care about side effects, I'm going to pick something else because Lamotrigine is not going to be a good option. And we can see these. The, I mean, Lamotrigine basically has a negligible effect size according to this study. Um, and, and then here we have Buspirone really neg doesn't really do much for anxiety, SSRIs. Um, for negative symptoms of schizophrenia, don't really help that much. Mantadine for Alzheimer's doesn't really help. Uh, antidepressants in major depression, small, almost borderline, um, moderate effect size. Um, SSRIs for GAD, about the same. So, so SSRIs for both anxiety and depression work about the same. Pregabalin, 0.37. Some studies mention this much higher. Um, some studies will say up to 0.5 or 0.6, but this study says 0.37. Um, more small effect size, lithium for mania, SSRIs for OCD, buprenorphine for opiate withdrawal, lanzapine, fluoxetine combination for bipolar depression, atypical antipsychotics for agitation and dementia. So you can see we're slowly getting closer. Methylphenidate for adult ADHD, 0.49. Now we're getting into the moderate effect sizes, so now we're actually changing. So first of all, just notice how many medicines that we use are actually in the small effect size. So take antidepressants for depression. This is, this is what we start for everyone. 
um, it's all it's not it's not going to be as effective as as something else. Now we have to remember that what an effect size is is the difference between placebo and um, and the medicine itself. That's really why these antidepressants don't have as big of an effect size, because our placebos are actually quite effective. So that sugar pill is very effective. If it wasn't an effective, this 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 uh, effect size would be much bigger. Um, so this is why sometimes people will say therapy is so much better than, than medications, because therapy's effect size is 0.5, medication effect size is only 0.3, but that's actually a misnomer, because in those therapy studies, their, their placebo is no treatment at all, it's a wait list. And so of course therapy is going to be uh, have a much bigger effect size, because the treatment is no treatment. Here the treatment, the, the placebo is, is a sugar pill, and sugar pills are actually quite effective. Um, so we're trying to find that difference between a sugar pill and no sugar pill, and so that's why this ends up being only 0.31. Um, and so that's important to remember, too, with the effect size is what am I actually comparing it to. Um, so yeah, but I'll tell patients, you know, I don't expect, I expect, and I know from the STAR-D trial that you're going to get 50% um, uh, um, uh, response, 30% remission. So I'm going to cure one in three people using my first antidepressant, and I'm up front with that, so they know what to expect. But we're going to get this cured eventually. It could take months, though. I have to be honest with you, um, so that you just kind of set the standard right up front what's going to happen. Um, going back to moderate effect sizes, bupropion for ADHD is actually j almost just as good as methylphenidate. So that's, I would probably use this first, since it has less side effects. SSRIs for panic disorder, now we're cooking. Very good. Carbamazepine for mania, 0.61. Antipsychotic augmentation in OCD, very good. Esketamine, 0.65. Clomipramine for trichotillomania, modafinil and ADHD, even better than a stimulant. So this non-stimulant option is actually very good. Um, uh, amphetamine in adult ADHD, even better than modafinil. Um, benzodiazepines for insomnia, 0.81. Large effect size. This is for sleep quality, not sleep duration. That's an important difference. Of course, it's addictive, so that's why we don't use it. And it's only going to really work for two weeks. So the study probably, my guess would be, that it ended at two weeks. Clozapine and schizophrenia, very good. IV, um, ketamine, and MDD. So notice the IV and ketamine is different from the S-ketamine, which is the nasal spray. So you have the same um, drug, but then different formulations, and you're going to end up with a different effect size. And then uh, the grand, um, almost best medicine in all psychiatry, Liz Dexamphetamine, which is known under the brand name of Vyvanse with an effect size of 1.2 to 1.6. Absolutely massive. This, of course, is in the adult population. Um, in the child population, the effect size for all these stimulants, including methylphenidase, is actually a lot higher. So it really does, uh, the effect size will change based on your population. One last word from Darth EBM then. This is how we started. He told you that you don't know the power of evidence-based medicine. And what I tell you now is that you actually know the power of evidence-based medicine and that hopefully this will change your practice for the better.